G'day, I'm Paul. So, when we reviewed the Volkswagen Amarok at the international launch, our video went crazy. It was the most watched Amarok review on the internet. So, now, it's time to follow it up with an actual drive of the new Amarok here in Australia. We're going to test it in the same way that we test all the other cars, just to see whether this does stack up to what the old Volkswagen Amarok actually did. So let's talk pricing. So this here is the top specification. It's called the Aventura. This is the turbo diesel V6. Don't worry, there is a petrol as well that we will get to eventually, but today is going to be all about the diesel. This is priced at just under $80,000. If that's too expensive, the entire range kicks off at just under 51 grand. This competes with things like the Ford Ranger, funnily enough, uh, the Isuzu D-Max, the Nissan Navara, Toyota Hilux. There's a stack of competitors in this segment, as I'm sure you already know. In fact, we actually reviewed all of the competitors in this segment in our recent Ute of the Year test. So that was a whole bunch of fun. If you do want to watch some of that content, have a look at the link in the description below. Today, we're going to do a detailed review of the new Amarok. So if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes on the screen. Or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and use the chapters below. If you haven't done this already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you can find out when we review a blue ute. Now, before I get into the exterior design, I will call out, there's a bit of noise and stuff happening in the background at the moment of cars I can't show you, but anyway, they're very closely related to this. Um, so ignore that for the moment. Uh, you've got eight different colors to pick from. All but white is going to set you back just under a thousand dollars. Let's talk design. So I did mention in our international review that I actually think this looks sensational in person. It really has some presence. I think I could take or leave this sort of X stuff here, but you can get other grades that have different coloured centre sections. But for me, this is a very smart looking vehicle and Look, I think it actually looks better than some Ranger variants as well. It just has a really sort of nice presence to it. You've got a big Volkswagen logo down the front there with a camera for the 360 camera. Amarok just down here as well. You've got a section down here for the radar and also cooling for that turbo diesel V6. V6 badge up here, which signifies that this obviously is the diesel variant. I mentioned before that this is available with a petrol, a four cylinder turbo petrol. Same price as this. And I'm really excited to drive that because while it has been offered in the States previously in Ranger, hasn't actually been offered here in Australia before. So see what that's like. Over on your headlights, you have full LED headlights with a matrix LED setup. So that means it does active shadowing. Cars are approaching you, you can stay on the high beams and it won't actually be noticed by any other cars on the road. Down the bottom, you have a set of LED fog lights as well. Now, whip around to the side here. I've got something interesting to show you. This is a set of 21 inch alloy wheels on a dual cab ute. Never thought I'd be saying that, but quite a nice design. So machine finish on the outside, piano black on the inside there with the Volkswagen logo down the bottom. Wheel arch cladding here as well with a little notch up the top there. Now this is interesting because uh, Volkswagen has designed this to be a bit of a sporty model. So what they want to get out of this is um, a dynamic feel behind the wheel in comparison to the Ranger, which this shares a platform with. Look, I'm going to be mentioning the Ranger a fair bit in this video because now that we've spent so much time driving it, I really do have a really good point of comparison and I'll be able to tell you things that Volkswagen has done better or Ford has done better because if you are buying this, you're probably cross shopping Ranger as well. So um, I'll uh, mention that throughout the review. Now in terms the ride and handling tune it's our understanding that this actually has a bespoke tune for Amarok in comparison to Ranger so when we do go for a bit of a drive I'll run you through uh, what that actually feels like behind the wheel they had engineers embedded here in Ford's design and development program because the Ranger was designed and engineered in Australia so uh, the Volkswagen engineers were working on the Amarok uh, alongside the Ranger guys so um, I'll be keen to see what it all feels like behind the wheel up the top here, you've got chrome on the wing mirror for the Aventura. Got a camera here for the 360 camera. Side steps down the side here. I did mention in the international review, these feel a bit sort of cheap. Um, it's the same story in a lot of dual cab utes today outside of stuff like the Raptor, which has proper sort of uh, side steps. These sort of feel a bit cheap and flimsy. Chrome uh, door handles there, chrome strip around the side. Privacy glass, you have roof rails up here. You get this on the Aventura, it's a compass, and uh, you get this uh, similar setup to the Wild Track, which is a sailplane with an electric uh, roller cover there as well. Disc brakes on the rear, leaf spring setup, and again, uh, similar to the Ranger, the damper is on the outboard of the chassis rails to give it better dynamic performance, and 275 wide tyres all round. Full motion here because this is obviously an all wheel drive vehicle. Come around to the back here with me. Now, around the back here, you have a set of full LED tail lights. I really like this design. They've kind of blocked off this section here to make it look different to the Ford Ranger, and I think this really gives it 
nice sort of unique stance and vibe out on the road. This doesn't actually have uh, the radar integrated into it, similar to what Ford has. Instead, Volkswagen has mounted their radar here behind the bumper, uh, as opposed to within that uh, taillight section. You've got a four motion badge there, Amarok, bossed into here. You then have a big Volkswagen logo there with a camera in the center. This is your step up into the tray. Uh, unlike Ford, they don't have the, the side steps to be able to get into the tray there. So you enter the tray from the rear here, but you do have lights built into here for your uh, registration plate. Three and a half ton brake to towing capacity. And I'll show you just some of the uh, features inside the tub here and also the dimensions you're gonna find as well. Torsion bar here to make it easy to open and close. Button off to the side here to open that roller cover. And then once that opens, it exposes a light. You've also got hooks on the side here, a 12 volt power outlet. In terms of the actual dimensions, it has a load length of just over 1500 mil, a load width of just over 1200 mil, and a payload of just under 900 kilos. So it is all sort of uh, pretty straightforward and a very usable space. It is um, all pretty sort of hassle free. That does take up a little bit of room, this roller cover, so you will notice that Right down the front there you are. A little compromise there, but it's not too bad. Also on the key as well, you can open and close the roller cover by double tapping that too. So it is kind of versatile. Oh, shut that up. Now, let me know in the comments section, what do you think about the Amarok? Do you like the design? Do you like the offering? What do you think about the pricing and the range they're offering in Australia? Let me know in the comments section below. So we are inside the Amarok. We will start off with the key. So you've got unlock, lock, and this is the button you press to open the tailgate. And then on the back there, you've got a Volkswagen logo. It's a proximity sensing key, so you can leave that in your pocket. And once you're inside, you have a push button start attached here to the steering column. So let's talk design to start with. And look, I think uh, just based on the time I've spent with the car now and just looking at all of the surfaces and all of the bits and pieces that are going on around here, this does feel more premium than the Ranger. And it's stuff like this. Uh, dashboard finish here that just feels a lot nicer and better presented. And when you're spending $80,000 on a car, you probably want things to look as nice as they possibly can. Uh, same story here along the doors. It just looks uh, sort of nicely finished. It is let down a little bit by these scratchy surfaces here as you sort of work your way down the side of the car. Uh, which is a little bit disappointing, but outside of that, I do think that there is a noticeable difference here between uh, the Ranger and the Volkswagen Amarok in terms of how premium it actually feels. In terms of your touch points, you've got uh, sort of softish there and soft on the door panel there as well. Uh, and in terms of how soft it is, well, we've got our durometer. We've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description below. Now, what about build quality? So, did notice a couple of things. Um, that is kind of loose there. You'll notice that even though that's clicked in, it's sort of sitting a little bit loose. Uh, I did notice as well that some of these finishes along the top there, you can see the exposed sort of, uh, plastic edging on that as well. That could be a little bit better. I also did notice here in the back seat, and I'll show you that in a bit more detail when we do hop in the second row, but this is loose as well. So a couple of things there worth noting. Um, and also door slam test is what it sounds like. Nice and solid. Now let's talk infotainment. So you've got a 12 inch infotainment screen in the center here and a 12 inch display ahead of the driver. I'll start off with the infotainment. So it comes standard with inbuilt satellite navigation. That all sort of works uh, fairly well. The home button is up the top here. So you use that to access all of the, the home features. Uh, and then you can also dive in through to settings using that navigation menu as well. And then you've got all the different functions as you go. So one thing I will call out as well is that you do have shortcut buttons down the bottom here. So you can adjust your volume using a manual knob. You've got hazard lights, parking, climate control, uh, assistance for, for safety features and also drive modes. But it is a little bit frustrating that there is no sort of set functions for doing basic things like uh, you know, putting it on recycled air, for example. You have to actually go into the climate menu and then manually press this button here. So it is kind of like a two-step process. You have to take your eyes off the road to achieve all of that. And I think they could have probably used a, a better integration here of the buttons for the infotainment system. If I do compare this to the Ranger though, this is significantly quicker. So I don't know whether they use a different processor or it's just that their skin has been programmed better, but compared to my car, the Raptor, this is just so much faster and easier to use. It doesn't uh, sort of have lag every time you go into some of these menus and 
everything just happens really nicely. In terms of smartphone mirroring, you have both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. This is what Apple CarPlay looks like. This is the other thing I love compared to the Ranger. <laughs> 100 fun songs for kids, that wasn't for me. Uh, I like here that this actually takes up more of the screen. In the Ranger, there's this redundant menu down the bottom there that kind of gets in the way of things, whereas this is a big screen takeover there, and it's nice and sharp and easy to use. In addition to that as well, I also like that if you do want to uh, jump to other parts of uh, things that you've done previously, the shortcuts are down the bottom here. In the Ranger, it is incredibly clumsy and silly. You have to click and swipe up, which is impossible to do while you're driving. Whereas here in the Amarok, you just press it and then it just happens. So it is just much easier to do it that way. And this is what Android Auto looks like. So again, nice full screen integration there. Nice and quick as well. So yeah, no complaints there. On the sound system front, you have AM, FM, DAB, digital radio. See, it is, that is a little laggy there when I enter that menu, which I haven't been to for a little bit. Uh, that is all plumbed through an eight-speaker Harman Kardon branded sound system. Sound system's really good. It's about on par with the Ranger. It doesn't sort of feel any better or worse than that. The Ranger has a B&O Play sound system, uh, but I think in terms of quality of sound system for a dual cab ute, it is uh, pretty sort of impressive there. Now, jumping over to the screen ahead of the driver, this is, I think, where Volkswagen has really differentiated itself from the Ranger offering, because you get here a standard, that big 12-inch display. You can't get that in the Ranger unless you go to a Raptor. So even the Wildtrak has a, a minimized version of this display. And even if I compare it to the bigger display on the Raptor, this is a significantly better setup. It just looks much nicer and it's much quicker and doesn't have anywhere near as many bugs as the, the Ranger has when it comes to displaying things there. So I think Volkswagen's put a lot of effort into making sure that that screen works really nicely and does everything that it's meant to do. Now let's talk about safety tech. So you have autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection. You've got an auto dimming rear vision mirror. AEB works both forwards and in reverse as well, which is great news. Blind spot monitor in that wing mirror there. You do have rear cross traffic alert and then also a lane keeping assistant. Uh, radar cruise control as well. We'll test out the lane keeping assistant on our bowl a little bit later on when we do go for a bit of a drive. You have front and rear parking sensors and a 360 camera. Uh, this is what that looks like. So there you go, pretty clear view out the front there. 360 view is okay, but a bit sort of distorted around the edges. You can then zoom in to certain functions too. So you can look uh, out the front there, or you can look a little further down the back. You've also got the ability to go in on edges of the car and also do things like your hitch uh, assist so it shows you how close you are to the trailer you then also have broader views there for the front and the back as well so yeah pretty decent camera setup uh, quite sort of impressed with that and this is what the horn sounds like now let's talk about practicality and we'll start off with your connectivity so you've got a 12 volts outlet down the bottom here a usb c port a usb a port you also have a usb a port up here for a dash cam which is great uh, you have a wireless phone charger down the bottom here so you can slide your phone down there and that all sort of starts charging and everything um it is a little bit interesting though, because you know you see there as I try and get my phone in, it can be a little bit clumsy because what they've done is they've integrated the brake controller, which comes standard with the car down here. And in the Ranger, it's actually over here. So I don't know why they've not used the space here where it's not going to get in the way of things. In addition to that, um, one of the other things that is a bit frustrating that I'll run you through in a second is that the cup holders have moved from here to here. So that means when the gear stick is in park, it is a bit tricky to get things in and out of that slot, but um, just a minor grievance there. In terms of storing your drinks, so coffee cup, it can fit here in the cup holders without any dramas, no delitting there. Coffee cup is also held in by these teeth. Now, I do have a complaint here with regards to where these uh, sort of cup holders are located. So uh, part of the issue I had this morning when I had the coffee in there, if you have it in either of these, because this is so high, you're driving along, you want to get your coffee, you kind of have to reach back awkwardly to pull it out and then you have a sip and then stick it back. Uh, these cup holders were moved from this location here in the Ranger to here. So they are quite tricky to sort of reach. And as a result of that as well, you don't have as much storage too, because this whole area is taken up by the gear stick. Gear stick could have easily been moved over to bring those cup holders back and, and make this a little better. The other thing I just find completely bizarre as well is that in uh, Wildtrak and Raptor and also across the entire Everest range, you actually have 
cup holder holes here under the air vents. And instead, Volkswagen has put the light switch here, which means you can't actually put the cup holders in. Uh, this is what it looks like with our water bottle in there. So again, fits in fine with the teeth. You can also fit water bottle inside the door there. We'll try our larger water bottle, see if that fits inside the door. Yes, it does. You just have to kind of cram it in there. In terms of other storage, you do have this center console here, which is quite nice and deep. You then also have glove box down the bottom here. That's also joined by this top glove box as well, which is nice and big too. So it's a much better storage space than it is in the uh, in the Ranger. You've also got a sunglasses holder up the top here and a little storage nook on top of the dashboard. Now on comfort, you have dual zone automatic climate control. I mentioned before that you have to access this menu here to adjust your temperatures and also switch it on and off and also put it into recycled mode. And then your headed seats are accessed through the screen here as well. Just on uh, comfort, uh, these seats are fantastic. I don't know, they, they kind of look the same as the Ranger seat, uh, but the Volkswagen guys at launch actually mentioned that there are some differences to the foam in these seats, and you can tell the difference. They are just fantastic to sit in, and that's one of the things I liked in the previous generation Amarok, that they just hugged you in nicely and, and kept you uh, comfortable, and I'm feeling the same thing here. Electrically adjusted for both the driver and front passengers, so you can go forwards, backwards, backrest can go forwards and backwards. You can lift the front, the back, and also lumbar adjustment. Now, just on the steering wheel, it's a bit of an odd one uh, because this looks kind of the same as the steering wheel from the old Amarok. Uh, it doesn't look like the steering wheel they're now using in a lot of new Volkswagen products. It also has a stack of blank buttons around here. So three of those buttons are blank. The explanation we got from uh, the Volkswagen uh, engineers at the international launch was that uh, when they were co-developing this platform with Ford, Ford offered a, a number of cables that had certain functions and uh, this is the steering wheel they decided to use and obviously there are less cables than there are buttons here on the steering wheel. So I don't know, I thought maybe a bit more effort could have been put into that to not have it looking as, as blank as it is. But um, outside of that, steering wheel sits nicely in the hand and offers both tilt and reach adjustment. And on our reach test, all of this stuff is easy to reach while you're driving. So second row, let's have a little look. I'll grab this lever, I'll just pull this up so I can show you what it looks like under here. Uh, so this is where you're gonna find your jack and just a little bit of storage. Uh, I think that the Ford system is slightly better because the jack and all these other bits and pieces are actually behind that seat. So you do get this as additional storage, whereas here it's all sort of taken up by these uh, accessories. But when you do drop that out of the way, you do have access to a little bit of storage behind here. So you can see they've got a subwoofer there and also an amplifier as well. You can, I guess, tuck something into there if you want to, but um, it is sort of slightly cramped. You do have two top tether points as well for a baby seat. And this is what it looked like with my baby seat in there. Just to give you an idea of how much room you have. So uh, when you are in here, my seat is pretty much all the way back. It kind of gives you an idea of how much room I have. My knees are sort of dug into that a little bit. Not a great deal of toe room there. Headroom is not too bad. Creature comforts, you have air vents here, 12 volt outlet. This is the section that I mentioned before that just isn't finished very well at all. And I found the exact same issue on one of the cars at the launch as well. So they obviously uh, haven't fixed that as part of production just yet. Uh, you do have map pockets in the back of these seats with little storage nooks up the top there as well. Got a center armrest here with two cup holders. The bottle can go in there and bottle can fit inside the door as well. Now, what about our windows? So it's auto up and down. They go all the way down as well, very impressive. So we've just hit the road in the Amarok. So uh, just recapping, uh, I know if you've watched our other Ranger reviews, this is all gonna get uh, quite repetitive, but uh, under the bonnet there, you've got a three litre turbocharged V6 diesel engine. Makes 184 kilowatts of power and 600 newton meters of torque. And that's all mated to a 10 speed automatic transmission. So different to previous generation of Amarok was full-time four-wheel drive when you mated it to the V6. And here on the other hand, you can actually run it as two-wheel drive high range, which I actually prefer to save fuel. Uh, so you can run it in that, you will see a definite fuel saving there. The other good news here as well is that you can run your rear diff lock in two-wheel drive high range as well, which is excellent. You can then also switch this to four-wheel drive automatic. So four-wheel drive automatic is designed to work on any surfaces. Again, it's not like other four-wheel drive systems that are in four-wheel drive high range that you can't use on sealed surfaces. This actually works across a variety of surfaces. 
you can then run through to four-wheel drive high range and four-wheel drive low range as well. When we go off-road, I'll run you through some of the off-road controls too. How does all that feel behind the wheel? Um, look, this gearbox is actually really good. So if I lay into the throttle here, it'll dive back through the gears quite quickly and punch me back in the seat. Never really feels lazy and it's always on the ball, ready to go. So it is uh, definitely a really good uh, gearbox tune and I think it works beautifully with this engine as well. You can see that whole combo has just come together really nicely for this chassis. Uh, if you do want to do any manual shifting though, it is a little bit annoying that you have to press M on the side of the gear stick here and then flick up and down through the gears using the side of the gear sticking. Because it is a 10 speed, you're doing a whole lot of bloody flicking there. It would be nice to just have paddle shifters. I know that you associate paddle shifters with sporty cars, but ultimately uh, what we discovered when we did our big uh, ute test, when we did the uh, towing section, paddle shifters would have actually come in really handy for the longer descents where you just want to be able to, to slap through the gears and keep your eyes on the road. So uh, it would be nice if they actually integrated a paddle shifter option at some point. Fuel economy comes in at under nine litres per 100 k's. Let's have a little look here at what we're averaging. So we're sitting on 10 exactly. So it's actually not a bad figure. This is a mix of city, highway, and also a couple of faster laps around the proving ground here. So I'm pretty happy with that fuel economy figure. Uh, it's really uh, not that bad when you consider the size of this vehicle and the size of the engine as well. Let's talk about the ride in and around the city. So. Look, you are going to sacrifice ride quality on the 21s. There's definitely no denying that. And that is one of the downsides of having a pretty cool looking wheel and something that is designed to be a little bit sportier. And we'll see if it is actually sportier when we go for a faster drive in a second. But uh, the end result of that is a slightly firmer ride in and around the city. Not the end of the world, but uh, yeah, it is definitely firmer than the previous generation Amarok. And it does feel like they've gone to a bit more effort to emphasize the sportiness. I am looking forward to driving the other variants that are on 18s and, and different sized wheels because I think we'll see a big difference there in terms of ride quality. Definitely not over the top, uh, but it is just something you notice. Okay, let's talk sine waves. Let's get it up to 130 here for our sine waves. This is maximum speed in Australia. Gives us a bit of an idea of what the body control's like. So there's 130. Oh, that is really floaty. Oh, it actually feels like we're slightly leaving the ground there. That's interesting. So I don't know what they've done there with the ride because the ride actually does feel slightly firmer in and around the city, but there on the sine waves, you can feel it doesn't quite have the body control at the top end. So they have dialed in some softness there. And I think that is to compensate for the 21 inch wheels. I think if you kept it uh, quite firm, it would be firm constantly and it'd be <laughs> pretty much doing your head in all the time. Okay, time to hit the bumpiest, most terrible road in Australia. We do this at 90 k's an hour to see what the ride quality is like if you do end up in some of the dodgier parts of Australia. There's 90 k's an hour there. You can hear in my voice that it is shaking around a fair bit. It's actually doing a really good job. So even though it is on 21s, it's really not that bad. Here's our condensed sine wave. So this is throwing the car around a fair bit there, but it's not too bad. Yeah, look, it is doing a commendable job here. Again, I've just shocked it. With this being on 21s, the ride actually feels as good as it does. So, yeah, that is uh, quite impressive. Now, when it comes to faster driving, there is no sport driving mode, but what I'm gonna do is put it into 4A and we'll go for a little punt around our circuit here. You can see the power distribution in front of us there that just gives us a bit of an idea of what the car's doing. Tip it into our first corner. A body roll but uh, when you get stuck into it it actually just shoots out of the corner really nicely you kind of feel like you know exactly what it's doing um, and I can just lay into the throttle out of that corner and you can see the power distribution is just giving us torque where we need it uh, it doesn't actually like when it's in rear wheel drive it tends to be a bit tail happy when you send a sudden surge of that torque to the rear axle but here with 4A active, even in these slightly damp conditions, it is actually holding on really nicely. These aren't the most ideal tyres if you are planning on kind of doing any sportier driving. They are highway terrain and they run out of traction pretty quickly, but you know, th this is perfect for something like a mountain pass, or if you do want to just get stuck into it for a bit of a fun drive, but still have that highway terrain available for later. <laughs> actually pretty good. Here comes our back straight. It definitely feels sportier than the Ranger and I am noticing here, especially when it is slightly faster, you do have more of 
available traction. It is holding on better. Great communication through the steering wheel as well. You're really hoofing along nicely there. So, yeah, not too bad. It is pretty impressive and it does definitely feel sportier than the equivalent Ranger. Uh, one other thing that's slightly different to Ranger is AdBlue. So this has around a 20 litre AdBlue tank. It is bigger than the AdBlue tank that was in the previous gen of Amarok, which means you're not going to be filling it up as often. And then this also has an 80 litre fuel tank. Now, cabin noise. Um, this is an interesting one because I don't know if it's my ears deceiving me, but this does feel quieter than the Ranger. Even though, you know, it is very much a shared platform, it does feel quieter. So uh, this is the result when we used our calibrated sound meter. We'll also overlay results from when we did our last Ranger test, keeping in mind it wasn't our calibrated sound meter back then, but it should give you a rough indication of how close they are in terms of cabin noise when you are on smooth and coarse chip surfaces. Let's talk visibility. So I can see clearly down the front of the car there, uh, the, the little sort of uh, bonnet bulges there are great because they give you a good indicator of how close you are to things down the front. You've got a blind spot monitor built into the wing mirror. That also takes into account trailer length, which is set on this screen here. So it's a really great system and uh, really increases the safety when you are towing as well. Visibility out the back is fine. There's no dramas there. And then you have all of these cameras that you have access to when you are sort of trying to park in and around the city with some big wing mirrors too. Okay, time to test uh, this lane support system. So this doesn't have uh, like a lane tracing function like you do find in some Volkswagens and also like you do find in the Ford Ranger. All it has is just a lane keeping assistant. So uh, I'm going to engage that. We'll engage cruise control as well. Okay, so there we are at 70 kilometers an hour. I'll just bump that up by 1K now. Okay, so we're going to test this in our three outer lanes. We just want to see how well it works in everyday life. Uh, I wasn't overly impressed with this when I was driving it on the freeway. It kind of just ping-ponged within the lane. You do have to pretty much keep your hand on it the whole time. Oh, that seems to be doing a decent enough job here in this lane. I'll jump up to the next lane over. See what it's like here. Wait for that to engage. That's active. Well, it's actually not doing that bad of a job. That's sort of keeping us pretty central to the lane there without any dramas. So maybe I just caught it napping. Uh, all right, we'll jump up to our highest banking. This is basically designed to, to give us an idea of how much torque it's willing to apply to the steering. There we go. There you go, it's actually doing a decent job there. So that is a pass in lane one, two, and three. There you go. Okay, let's do some performance testing. Uh, predictably, it has just started raining. <laughs> just my luck. So uh, we'll see how we go. So I'm going to line up here. We're going to do it a little bit differently because I need this slightly better surface for the wet to start off on. But we're going to go all the way through to 120 and we'll see what our overtaking time is as well. There is no sport mode, so I've just turned stop start off. We'll load up the throttle. Two wheel drive automatic first, then we'll go to uh, 4A and see how that works. So here we go, a bit of throttle, tiny bit of wheel slip there off the line. We are getting there, we'll go through to 120. And there we are, I'll bring it up to a stop. This surface is terrible in the wet, uh, that's all right. There we go. Uh, let's have a look at that. So. 0 to 100 came in at 9.31 seconds, so okay, but not amazing, and 80 to 120 was 6.44 seconds, so again, uh, not too bad, but also not amazing. So what we'll do now is uh, we'll go back and try it again, this time in four-wheel drive automatic to see if that actually helps us. Okay, time for our next run. I've just moved it over to four-wheel drive automatic. We'll see if it is any better in that mode. It is so wet out here, it's ridiculous. Um, so look, in four-wheel drive automatic, we shouldn't have any traction issues at all. So we'll see how we go. Uh, I'll actually change that screen so we can have a proper taco. So here we go. All right, I felt a bit stronger off the line there. Take it all the way through to 120. Uh, here we go, there's 100, and 120, I'll just get on the brakes. Okay, let's have a little look. So, that time around, 0 to 100 
was 8.57 seconds, so significantly better. And then 80 to 120 was 6.38 seconds, which is slightly better as well. So, yeah, look, I think it is clearly better there in uh, four-wheel drive automatic. And that is going to get you off the line fastest. Uh, I don't actually have the numbers for the Ranger here in front of me, but we'll overlay them on the screen there just so you can see a comparison. Keeping in mind, it is still a little bit wet at the moment. So that is going to obviously affect these figures a bit. Next up, we're going to do a break from 100. And look, it is sopping wet at the moment. So I'm just going to do this anyway so we can log a figure. But what I'll also aim to do is actually get a figure in the dry as well that we can overlay at the end just so you can get a clear indication of how quickly it stops. But here we go from 100 k's an hour. Oh, wow. forever to stop, which is understandable given it is wet. Uh, let's have a look there. So 100 to zero took 4.86 seconds and 66.98 metres. So a very long time to stop in the wet. Um, we will overlay a stopping time here in the dry as well, just so you do have a point of reference there. But um, yeah, just shows you that these dual caveats take a long time to stop in the wet compared to a regular car. Okay, and now our reverse acceleration test. Let's see how quickly this will go in reverse. Here we go, match that throttle. There it is there, 38 kilometers an hour. Okay, so it is time to do a little bit of light off-roading in the Amarok. Let me run you through uh, all of the settings and all of the fun stuff here. So to start with, I'm gonna switch uh, stop start off. Uh, and it is a bit annoying, there's no button for that. You gotta go through a menu and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I already mentioned before when we were driving on the road that you do have your standard uh, sort of four wheel drive mode. So two wheel drive high range for on road driving, four wheel drive automatic for on road driving, four wheel drive high range for driving on unsealed surfaces and four wheel drive low range for driving on unsealed surfaces. If you do want a better explanation of why that is the case and how all of that works, uh, have a look at this video up here, which is our four wheel drive controls explained video. You also have a manual button here here for the rear diff lock that you can activate in all of these drive modes, which is excellent. You have a hill descent control and a traction control button. You also have drive modes. When you push this, it takes you into the drive mode settings. So you have eco, tow and haul, slippery, mud and ruts, and deep snow and sands. Now, in terms of your actual four wheel drive specifications, you have an approach angle of 30 degrees, a departure angle of 25.6 degrees, ground clearance of just over 230 mil, and a weighting depth of 800 millimeters. Uh, so what we're gonna do first is go over our offset mogul in two wheel drive high range. This is just to see how well the traction control system works when one of the drive wheels loses traction, and we are only sending torque to the two drive, uh, two rear drive wheels at this stage. So I'm gonna get that wheel off the ground. Currently we're seesawing. So we have that wheel off the ground, that wheel off the ground, and I'm going to apply some throttle here and let traction control do all of its work. I'll just gradually apply more and more throttle. I can feel it biting at the moment. That is awesome. It has just done all of that for us. So basically what it's doing is it's just applying a brake to that wheel as it goes, and that's causing it to send torque to the other wheel which then gets us out of this bind where we only have one wheel with traction. So very impressive there. So we'll do a U-turn now and attack that in four wheel drive high range. Okay, so let's slot this over to four wheel drive high range. Keep in mind, I'm not going to lock the rear diff. We'll just see if this will get us over here in high range. There it is, it's active up there. You can see that working. In fact, there's actually an off-road menu here that I might bring up so we can see what it's doing. So you can see there we've engaged front and rear uh, axles, and then you've got pitch and roll there as well. We'll have a look at that as we're climbing our next hill and then power distribution too. So let's see how this goes. In 4H, it's actually just 50-50. So if I roll onto the throttle there, you can see it's doing everything at the exact same pace. So we'll go pitch and roll. Okay, so here comes our offset mogul again. We're gonna get it to the point here where we have two wheels off the ground once more. And in 4H, it's actually sending 50% of torque to the front axle and 50% of torque to the rear axle. So I'll just gradually apply throttle now. Let traction control do its thing. There it is again. It is such a brilliantly tuned system. It just does what it says on the box. I haven't had to fiddle with anything. The traction control system just works, which is exactly what you want in a car like this, or in a ute like this. You just want it to work without any dramas. I also love how you get these screens come up as well, which just give you a really good idea of what's going on ahead of the car. 
Okay, so it is time to climb our hill. I'm going to set this to mud slash ruts. Actually gives you really cool animation there ahead of the driver when it's doing all of that. So in mud ruts, it engages the rear diff lock for us. I'll actually go to low range. So I'll put it into neutral, flick it over to low range. It says 4x4 shift in progress. There it is. So stability control is off in low range. Rear diff is locked. We're going to just climb up here with gradual throttle application. It has been very muddy here. This hill has been chewed up as well. So let's see how it goes. There's the camera coming up again. And we are on highway terrains here as well. <laughs> it is walking up here without any dramas at all. That is damn impressive. That is awesome. Nice. Um, all right, we'll go through our mud bog. So next step for us, um, we're going to go down this hill in front of us. What I'm going to do, just to show you why this vehicle is so impressive compared to some of the other peers in this segment, I'm going to go back to four-wheel drive high range. And a lot of these vehicles in four-wheel drive high range, hill descent control doesn't work if the rear diff is locked. So I've engaged all of that. That's all active. We're then going to uh, switch on our hill descent control just by pushing that. So it comes up saying hill descent control is ready. And then what we'll do is just creep over the edge here. I'll put our camera back on as well so we can see what's going on. We'll let the car do all of the work as we come across the edge here. There it is there. Very impressive. And I'm just trying to adjust the speed here using cruise control, but that doesn't seem to be doing anything for us. Actually, yes, it does. So there you go, I can adjust hill descent speed using cruise control as well, which is pretty good. So, um, so far, so good. What we're gonna do now, after I drive through this little <laughs> mud hole just here, is we're gonna go back up the hill. This time though, I'm going to stop halfway up and then try and get back on the throttle and see if it will actually work. Okay, so we'll slot this back into low range. Let me just straighten that up. Select low range. Rear diff is locked. All right, let's see what happens. So as a reminder, I'm going to drive up, come to a stop and then get back on the throttle. It is so muddy here. Let's see what happens. So I'll come to a stop just there. Wish me luck on the throttle. Ooh, it is doing a good job here. A little bit of wheel slip there. <laughs> that is impressive. I'm seriously impressed by this. It is such a good package just for Someone who wants to do some light off-roading like this, you know that you can approach a hill like that and know that the, the ute will just get through it without having to do anything too crazy. I've just had to press a few buttons here, engage a mode, and away it goes. So, yeah, pretty impressed with that. Okay, let's do a little bit of driving over some rocks here. So, ground clearance of over 230 mil, so it should be okay here in terms of clearance. I've left it uh, in low range here just so I can basically ride the brake with the throttle, gives me a bit more control over this. Gee, it's really comfy, even on 21s here, it's not too bad. Keep in mind though, if you are gonna be doing some serious driving on rocks, uh, a 21 inch wheel probably isn't going to be all that suitable if you do catch a rock on the edge. Looks like we just got the sidestep there. Not great sidesteps if you're gonna be driving over rocks either, by the way, because it will damage them pretty easily. So, um, but yeah, very comfy in here. Uh, I would just be looking at a more aggressive tire if you're gonna be doing anything sort of too hardcore off-road. And lucky last, let's have a look at how this goes through our water crossing. So it's currently sitting at 650. This has a weighting depth of 800, so it shouldn't be a drama. We'll see how it fares through here. I haven't been here for a little while, so. I've got no idea what sort of condition this is in at the moment. All right, here we go. So I'll just drop it in. Oh, that is nice and deep. All right, here we go. In through here. You can hear water lapping around there. Yeah, piece of cake, it's coming through very nicely. Be careful on the climb out of here. What traction is like. Yeah, no dramas at all. Very, very impressive. Yeah, look, uh, just like the Ford Ranger, this is great off-road. They've done such a good job with all the traction control systems and all the drive modes. It just gives you all the confidence you need. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be an expert, and this is fairly light off-roading. If you're gonna do anything more serious, you're gonna want, uh, obviously, different tires, but as a sort of out-of-the-box package, even on the 21s, I think this is pretty awesome.
Okay, so Volkswagen Amarok. Oh, actually, I probably should explain why I look different. Uh, we had to come back another day because we got rained out the other day and didn't get a chance to get some of the shots that we needed. So that's why we're here again. Um, so Volkswagen Amarok. Uh, look, I don't think this particular spec makes sense, the Aventura, because it's just under $80,000. Uh, it's, it's nine grand more than a Wild Track. And yes, you have to add a few packs to the Wild Track, and the Wild Track also doesn't come with the bigger screen. But now they've announced the Ranger Platinum, which brings it very close to this in terms of specification. And you are getting some more features in the Ranger that you don't actually get here in the Amarok. And this is still more expensive. So to me, the V6 diesel isn't where you'd be buying the Aventura. I think with the Aventura, it's more a petrol proposition because that's an engine you can't get in the Ranger range. So outside of those things, um, it drives really nicely. It is a nicely handling car in comparison to the Ranger. It feels a little sportier. They have tuned in a bit of that sportiness compared to Ranger. Uh, but outside of that, I did sort of think that some of that build quality stuff could be better. Uh, in the second row there, that stuff that was wonky, we also noticed the stitching on the passenger seat wasn't very good either. It was out of alignment and a little frayed at the bottom. So there are a few things here that hopefully Volkswagen will improve as the production process out of South Africa continues for the Volkswagen Amarok. So I am very keen to drive the rest of the Volkswagen Amarok range because I think that's where the value proposition starts making a whole lot more sense. So let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Have you ordered one of these? How do you justify the price over the Ranger? I am keen for your feedback. Let me know down there in the comments section. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon as well. But until next time, take it easy.